the last uh, class, we learned about short-run labor demand and long-run labor demand, but actually we did not do the full theory of long-run labor demand. What we did was actually conditional labor demand, meaning that we assume that the firm fixes the uh, amount of output, and then the firm, what firm does is to minimize the cost to produce the uh, desired output. And from that cost minimization condition, we can derive conditional labor demand, right? So to look at the full story of uh, labor demand in the long run, we have to look at the long run profit maximization, not the cost minimization only. So for the long run profit maximization, from the uh, profit maximization condition, we can derive these two conditions. Okay? If we have uh, E and K, so the profit maximizing condition is basically, since the profit is This is the profit, right? So if you maximize the profit, choose, if you choose E and K, and to maximize the profit, and if you know, for example, the, uh, how to maximize this function, then you can easily see that the condition should be these two equations, OK? So first condition is that BMPE equals W. And the second condition is the BMPK equals R. Okay. Basically, this is a, you can think of, you know, this is the short run profit maximization. This was short run profit maximization condition. We didn't have this because we assumed K was fixed. Now, since the K can be changed, so not only VMPE equals W, but also VMPK must be equals to R. Okay. So two conditions should be satisfied at the same time. Okay, so this is the profit maximizing condition in the long run. So it doesn't look that difficult. And from here, we can actually derive the cost minimization condition. Okay, why? Because If these two conditions are satisfied, right, then what is the cost minimizing condition? MLTS equals W over R. What is MLTS? M P E over M P K should be equal to W over R, right? So if these two conditions are satisfied, these conditions must be satisfied, right? OK, you can see that. Okay. If you divide okay, this by this, right, then you can, on uh, both sides, then it should be satisfied. So obviously, profit maximizing condition implies cost minimization. Okay. Obviously, if you do not minimize the cost, you cannot maximize the profit. Okay? That is the obvious, you know. Well, this intuitively must be quite obvious. Okay? So to maximize profit, whatever level of output you choose, you should minimize the cost. If not, you are not maximizing the profit. But as you can see that this, does this imply that? This cannot be, right? Because even if this condition is implied, is satisfied, these two equations may not be satisfied. Okay? So what it means is cost minimization does not imply profit maximization. Why? 
The thing is that cost minimization makes sense only when the output is determined. Okay? So you can think of the profit maximization as a two level of two stages of decisions. One, first stage, the firm should determine which level of output they should produce. And then given that output, they will find a way to minimize the cost. Then they can uh, maximize the profit. If they produce a wrong quantity, okay? So if they produce, let's say, too little or too much compared to profit maximizing level of output, even if they minimize the cost, their profit cannot be maximized. If they change output level, their profit will be even higher, even though they are currently minimizing the cost given the desired output. So profit maximization should, should you know, think of those two things at the same time, picking the right quantity and minimize the cost. OK, so that's what I just uh, said. So that's the how, what the profit maximization condition implies. OK, it's from the profit maximization condition, let's think of uh, impact of a wage, wage reduction on the output and the employment. OK, so first part is that we need to get the right output. So as I said in the uh, previous class, to think of the output, it is easier to think the uh, output, optimal output decision, which is basically in the perfectly competitive market, it should be P equals MC. Right? So given P, we have MC curve. Okay? So in this MC, okay, there is labor cost and capital cost is inside. Okay? If it's a short run, it's only the labor cost. But now we have labor and capital okay, inside it. Now, let's say wage falls. What happens? Marginal cost will be lower, right? Okay? To produce the same quantity, one additional, let's say, output, it will cost less because labor is cheaper. Okay? Let's say capital cost is the same, labor just got cheaper, so marginal cost should fall. When the marginal cost falls, then obviously the MC curve will move downward, okay, or move to the right. Okay? It moves downward, so optimal output will increase. Okay? So then, in this part, let's say this is before the wage reduction, wage change. So they were producing 100. That was the optimal level of output given the wage and rent. Now the wage falls. Then from the First diagram, we saw that now the optimal output is not 100, it's 150. So it means that they will change the level of output. So that means in this diagram, they will move from this isoquant to the you know, upper isoquant, which has 150. So now the, you know, the, the way of doing it is simple. It's cost minimization now. So 150, so what it does is that now given the wage and rent, they will minimize the cost to produce 150 outputs. Okay, what happens in this diagram? Okay, in, in this diagram, this was before the wage reduction. Now, wage falls, so the output changes. At the same time, since the wage falls, the slope of the ISO cost should change. How? Flatter or steeper? Wage falls. So the, s the slope is W over R, so wage got smaller, so it should be flatter. Okay? So now you see the flatter ISO cost curve. Okay? So in this diagram, as you see, the two things change. One is the ISO quant, the other is the slope of the ISO cost. Okay? Is that? So once you know that, you know, that should have happened, then using the diagram, you can show the new optimal level of employment, okay? the new labor demand. Okay? So it is determined at point R. Okay? Questions? Now, what happens to labor demand? Increase or decrease? In 
it increased. Okay. Okay. Now what we are going to think is that what's behind the change in the labor demand. To do that, we can think of uh, you know this way. Let's say wage rate falls. When the wage rate falls, then we know the labor got cheaper, relatively cheaper to the capital. Okay. Since labor is cheaper, so they substitute labor for capital. Okay. Meaning that using more labor and using less capital, even if they don't change the level of output. Okay? So if they keep the level of output same, they will do this. Anyway, so this part, they will, it will increase labor input. But the, the other, okay, this we call it substitution effect, okay, for obvious reason. The other one is that now wage rate falls, then we saw in the output diagram the marginal cost is lower, okay? So they will produce more. So production will increase. So that means that even if this part, let's say, even if you don't think of this part, only because they produce more, they will hire more workers to produce more, okay? So that means it will increase labor input too. So in both directions, the results are the same. Okay? In this part, we call it scale effect. Okay? Get that? So there are lots of effects, right? Substitution effect and scale effect. Okay? So in this case, as you can see, that both effects work to the same direction. Same direction. So, for example, when the wage rate goes up, then what happens? Labor got more expensive, right? So, substitute what for what? Substitute capital for labor. So, labor demand will fall. That's the substitution effect part. La wage rate goes up, then what happens to marginal cost? Marginal cost go up, right? So, they will produce less. So they will hire less workers, fewer workers. Okay? So it will decrease labor input or decrease labor demand. That is the scale effect. Okay? So either way, we have the same movement. Okay? So as you can see that in the long run, labor demand curve is negatively sloped, right? It's not positively. The wage goes up. Then we have substitution effect and scale effect, wage de labor demand falls in the long run. Wage goes down, then labor demand goes up in the long run. Okay. In the diagram, it's, uh, it's not that difficult to show what happens. Okay, wage rate falls. So it changes from Q0 to Q1. Okay. And then we have new point R, right? So this is the diagram we have seen. Now, to show the substitution and scale effect, the way of doing it is very similar to what we have done for uh, utility maximization. So what happens here is that we draw a hypothetical line that is parallel to the old ISO cost. Okay? So from P to S, what effect? P to S, this is this movement comes from what? Change in the scale, right? Change in the scale of production. So P to S is the scale effect. And S to R is the substitution effect. Okay? So as you can see, that in the conditional labor demand, there is only substitution effect. Okay? Here we have scale and substitution effect. Okay, questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you can do it. Yeah. Actually, you can do both ways. Okay? It doesn't matter, actually. The theoretically, it doesn't matter. Okay? Even if you draw substitution effect first or scale effect first, anyway, you will see the same direction. Okay? So, basically, the same. It's just, it's just a convention, okay? So 
I'm pretty sure if you look at another textbook, microeconomics textbook, they probably have this diagram. Okay? It doesn't matter. Okay? It's just the, you know, it's the same thing. Okay? It's the same as the uh, for the utility maximization also. You know? Sufficient effect and income effect. You can draw, you know, either sufficient effect or income effect first and then think of the rest as the other. Okay, it doesn't matter actually. Okay. The order doesn't matter. Okay. But if you take an, let's say some kind of test, probably matters, but to me it doesn't matter. Okay? But but uh, for the the sufficient income effect, the way of the way that the that those two effects are drawn in our textbook is the one that the labor economists use. Okay, labor economists always use, you know, the diagram. This one, I'm not sure. Okay. But anyway, in, the, in our textbook, it looks like this. So to me, it doesn't matter. Okay. So this is what happened. What happened to the total cost? What happened to total cost? Increase or decrease? It increased, right? So it changes. If you look at this part, right? R didn't change. Total cost changed. Now it's above. So that means what? C0 to C1. Actually, the total cost has increased. What happened? Why didn't it go down? Why did it increase? Obviously, it depends on how much the scale effect is, basically, right? If the scale effect is big enough, they produce a lot more, and it costs more to produce more, okay? So it's not clear, in this case, whether cost will actually go down or, or will go up, okay? In the conditional labor demand, when the wage falls, okay, then we know for sure the cost will not go up. Okay? But in this case, it's not true. Cost may go up or go down. Okay? Okay. So this diagram is actually, I'm, I believe it's, it's easy to understand, okay, what's happening here. Okay, so in the long run labor demand curve, it is basically negatively sloped. If you compare long run to the short run, which one is more elastic? Long run must be more elastic. I mean, it's, it's intuitively, it should, be the, it should be true, it's logically. Okay? In the long run, the firm has a lot more room to move, room to change the labor demand. So it should be more elastic in the long run. In the short run, they can change only labor input. In the long run, they can change labor and capital. So obviously, they have more means to change the labor input. So long run labor demand must be more elastic. Okay. The slopes are the same direction, but the more elastic. OK, but uh, there is uh, one more thing to think about in the long run is that change in wage may affect demand for capital. Well, the other way around, actually. Change in the cost of capital may affect labor demand. Okay? Why? Because they can change anything. Okay? So when the wage changes, in the long run, they can change capital input. Or if the cap cost of capital changes, then they can change the labor, in the long, labor input in the long run. Okay, think of this. When the wage rate falls, they think of the capital now. Labor becomes relatively cheaper. So what happens to the demand for capital? It should decrease, right? Because they substitute labor for capital, so they will use less capital. So demand for capital decreases. Okay? That's obviously the substitution effect part. Wage rate falls, so marginal cost decreases. Okay? So what happens to output? D 
desired output will increase. So they will use more or less capital. They will use more capital. Okay? So demand for capital will increase to produce more. That part we call it the scale effect. Okay? Get that? So in this case, the final effect, the final direction we don't know. It depends on which effect dominates. Okay, now let's change this to, let's say, rent. Rent cost of capital falls. Okay? What happens? Labor becomes relatively more expensive, okay? If the cost of capital falls. So substitute capital for labor. So demand for labor falls. Okay? That's the substitution effect part. And the capital cost falls, so marginal cost goes down. They'll produce more. To produce more, they will hire more, cap more labor. So demand for labor increases. That is the scale effect part. Okay? So that is the, uh, how you think of cross price effects. Okay? Okay, now if you draw a diagram okay, using substitution scale effect, now let's just, let, before we looked at the labor part, the employment part, let's look at the, this vertical axis, capital part. Okay? Basically, the, what happens is the same, but the, what we are interested in is different. Okay? Now, basically the same, same curve, okay? the same thing, but what we are looking at is the vertical axis, not the horizontal axis. So P2S is scale effect, okay, right? And S2R is substitution effect, okay? Get that? Okay. So as you can see here is that the directions are opposite. Scale effect, increase demand, capital demand. Substitution effect, decrease capital demand. So at the end here actually the demand for capital increased as well, okay? Questions? Yes, yes, that's true. Yeah. So in this case, it's the same. Basically, you look at this part, right? We are assuming R didn't change, only wage changes. So you do increase, so total cost goes up. Okay. So that means in, in this case, it's pretty much that they use less capital, but they use a lot more labor. So the, the labor cost, increase of labor cost, okay, exceeds the decrease in the capital cost. Okay. It's because they produce a lot more than before. Anyway, you can draw a diagram, obviously, to, for the case where the total cost falls. It's if this, if this uh, distance is short, okay, obviously, the total cost will go down. Okay. There is nothing wrong with it. Okay. So... Here, the labor and capital, the relationship between labor and capital, now we can, you know, call the labor and capital either substitute or complements, okay, by looking at the, the directions of these cross price effects, okay. So to think of this, first let's uh, think of uh, the extreme cases, two extreme cases. One we call the perfect substitutes. What are the perfect substitutes? Perfect substitutes are basically the, the two, two inputs can be substituted at a constant rate. Okay? So which is something like this. Let's say you have, I don't know, let's say you, have a, you, run, a, uh, you run a company. Okay? Let's say you, you make something. You make stuff. Manufacturing form. Now, let's say you can use a robot. Nowadays, the robot technology is so, so great. You can use a robot, or you can use just normal workers. Okay? Now, let's say if you purchase a robot, this robot can do 10 people, 10 workers' work 
Okay? It's exactly the same as 10 workers. So that means what? Having one machine or 10 workers, it doesn't make any difference to the uh, production process. Then we call those two are perfect substitutes. Okay? The rate is 1 to 10. Okay? One machine is basically a perfect substitute for 10 workers. Okay? So those cases we call perfect substitutes. So in this case, what we have is like a, this one machine does two people's work. Okay? So in this case, your output Q is K plus E divided by 2, which means that if you have, let's say, 0 and 2, 0 and 2, or 1 and 0, basically you have the same thing, okay? If you put 0 and 2, then you have one output, and if 1 and 2, then you have just one output, okay? The same. So if you think about it, it's basically it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an equation of a line, okay? So if you draw isoquant curve, you will see that it is just a straight line. And then the other extreme we call the perfect complements. In this case, those two inputs must be used at a fixed rate, okay, which means something like this. Let's say you, let's say you, you need a machine and let's say to produce something. Let's say you absolutely need a machine. But this machine requires four operators. Okay? So if you have three operators, it doesn't work. If you have five operators, one person should, doesn't have anything to do. Okay? So it absolutely one machine, four operators. You have to use them at the same time. Then we call it perfect complements. Okay? So in this case, what we have in the production function as the minimum function, okay? So minimum function is basically, it's a function that if you define a minimum function, in general, let's say uh, y is, uh, let's say, minimum of a and b, I can have this bracket, that means y equals a if a is, let's say, greater than or equal to B, and Y is B otherwise. Okay? Then this is the minimum function. It just that takes the whichever number smaller, okay, out of these two. So in this case, what it means? It means something like this. Let's say you have one machine and three workers, okay? Okay? Then what you have is one and three quarters, okay? That's, okay, one and three quarters. That's not good. So Q is three quarters, okay? Well, let's assume that you cannot have three quarters, okay? You, you have one, two, three for integer, okay? So that means it, it gives you zero. Okay, I can make the function more complicated, but let's say, can go that way. Or if, let's say, so if you wanna, produce only one output, what you need is one and four. You can have more than four here, but it doesn't change anything. It just, it will cost you more. Okay, you have one machine, five workers. This one worker paid, but does nothing, okay? So obviously the optimal choice must be just one and four. If you wanna produce two, what you need to keep is two and eight. Okay, not more, not less. Okay. So, if you draw isoquant for perfect substitutes, it's going to look like a straight line. Okay, in this case, 100 capital and 200 workers, same. 100 machines, 200 workers, they produce the same thing. Obviously, you can have in between, like, uh, you know, some combinations of the two. And in this case, it's L-shaped curve, okay? So if you want to produce five, you need five and 20, okay? So if you have 20 workers, even if you have more than five machines, the output will be still five. If you have five machines, you hire more than 20, the output is still five, 
Okay? So that's why we have this L shape. This one has a name, right? This is a Leontief production function. Okay? So the minimum function is called the Leontief production function. So these are two extremes. As you can see that usually when we draw ISO quant curve, the, the shape is basically in between, right? It's not perfect substitutes, not perfect complements, okay? Basically, it's a nice looking curve, okay? It's in between. So the, in these cases, it's, a, it's not perfect substitutes. So some substitutes and some, some are, it's basically it's a mix of two in between, okay? And so what you can, you know, guess is if the if those two output inputs are more like complements the shape of isoquant gonna look more like L shape okay. if they are more like substitutes then the shape gonna more look more like a straight line okay so as you can see that how curved the isoquant is tells you okay what kind of property, what kind of relationship these two inputs likely to have. If the curve is more like L, then those two are more likely to be very close to complements, perfect complements. And straight line, more likely to be perfect substitutes. Okay? And to Summarize that kind of uh, characteristic, we, call, we have something called elasticity of substitution. Basically, the elasticity of substitution tells you, in a way, it's a curvature of isoquant curve, how curved the isoquant is. Okay. So the, um, the definition is percentage change in the capital labor ratio, K over E, divided by percentage change in the relative price of labor, W over R. Okay, I'm not going to go into detail about this. Okay. And elasticity of substitution is non-negative. Okay. Meaning that something becomes more expensive relative to the other. Okay. It should be used less, and cheaper ones should be used more. Okay. So, for example, it becomes W over R gets smaller, meaning wage relatively got lower than rent. Okay, so wage, labor got more cheaper. That means then what ha should happen is K over E should be smaller now, right? Because they use more labor and less capital, so this number got smaller. So when this number gets smaller, this number will get smaller. When this number goes up, this number will also go up. So they always move the same direction. So elastic substitution is non-negative. And if two factors are perfect complements, and this this number must be zero. Okay. Why? I mean, the way I would think about it is that let's say wage relative <coughs> price, let's say labor got cheaper. Okay. What happens to your K over E? Okay. If you Keep the same output. Let's say labor got cheaper. So let's say the uh, you have you need four operators for one machine, but now you found out that operators the, the wage for operators are cheap. Okay, what are you gonna do? You wanna hire one more guy, right? It doesn't make any sense because this one more guy will do nothing. Okay, so um, what happens is even if wage got lower you will not change the ratio, right? That means what? So the elasticity of substitution must be zero. Perfect complement. And this one, infinite. Two factors are perfect substitutes, they are infinite. The reason it, it's infinite is that Let's say one, two workers 
gets to, does the same job as one machine. Okay, think about it. Then, given the wage and rent, what you are, what you're going to do? Okay, it's simple. If wage over rent, okay, is less than two, let's say, not two, one half, one half actually. <laughs> it's less than one half. Okay, what are you what's your optimal choice? If machine cost, let's say, make things simple. Let's say machine cost $10, OK? Workers cost $3. And you want to produce one output. What are you going to do? Hire two, hire two workers, right? You can hire either hire two workers or one machine. If you hire two workers, it costs you 6 bucks. If you hire one machine, it costs you 10 bucks. So that's the best way. Just hire two workers. No machine. Right? Okay? That makes sense, right? So uh, what it means is if if W over R is less than or equal to one half, let's say you just put equal in here. You have K equal zero, E equal something, some number. Okay? The output, let's say. Output divided by its, uh, its, its average productivity. But anyway, if it's greater than one half, then what happens? Okay? Machine is 10 bucks. Okay? Worker, 6 bucks. What are you going to do? So, let's say the, the wage rate goes up from, let's say, $4 to $6. Then what happens to your company in the long run? Before, you had only people, no machine, right? Because it was four bucks, so eight bucks versus 10 bucks. Now, the worker is six dollars. The wage rate is six dollars. So what are you going to do? You, you're going you're gonna to lay off, you're going to let go all of your workers, because now it costs you 12 bucks, OK, versus just 10 bucks for one output. So you just install all your machines. Okay? It's possible because it's in the long run. In the short run, you cannot do this, right? Because it's in the long run, it is possible. So that means k equals some number. K equals some number, right? Okay, and e equals zero. Okay? So the change is very extreme. It changes from some positive number to zero. Okay? That makes elasticity of substitution infinite. Okay? So obviously, in most cases, it should be in between. Okay? It's probably, this case is probably not that normal. It's, 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 it's kind of quite extreme thing, OK? So one thing does exactly the same thing like uh, one machine does. But this one is quite possible, you know? The, the, the example makes sense, right? For one machine needs some operators, OK? So this is much more uh, plausible than this, OK? So quite often, actually, if you read some economics, uh, let's say, textbook or something, in some cases, in, in actually in many cases, this one is assumed. Let's say if substitution is zero. In some cases, it makes sense. Okay. In some, in some uh, products, it's obvious. For example, like uh, if you run a transportation company, okay. Obviously, you need what? You need a car or bus or whatever, and then you need what? You need a driver. So that, in that case, it's obviously it's a Leon TF case. Okay, it's perfect complement. Yeah, but when it's, but it says that Google now is developing a new car that tries to replace people with machines. So if that happens now, then we goes to this part. But anyway, okay. 
So in most cases, what we have is some positive elasticity of substitution. Okay. Okay. So what's important? What's uh, what you need to know is that this coverture tells us that this coverture is closely related to the size of substitution effect. Okay? So if the elasticity of substitution is higher, then usually the substitution effect is bigger. Okay? So that's how they are related. Okay. Now, I will just look at briefly the Marshall's rules of derived demand. I'm not going to spend too much time. So this uh, Marshall's rules of derived demand is, tells us the situations that are likely to generate elastic labor demand curves in a particular industry. Okay. Uh, elasticity of labor demand is quite important when you, for example, design a labor market policy. Okay. For example, let's say think of a Think of a minimum wage. Okay? Let's say that you, you, you raise the minimum wage. Then uh, we will talk about minimum wage later. But what happens is that if you raise the minimum wage, then it is likely that labor demand will fall because the cost of labor goes up. By how much it falls, it depends on what? Elasticity of labor demand. If it's more, very elastic, then fall in the labor demand will be bigger. If it's not that elastic, the fall in the labor demand will be not that big. Okay? That's what the elasticity of demand basically tells us. Okay? How responsive the demand is to a change in the price. Okay? So it is quite important in, from the policy point of view, how big is the elasticity of labor demand? If it, if it is very inelastic labor demand, it probably you know, gives you more comfort when you try to change the price of labor. Okay? If you push up the wage, it doesn't change much. But if it's very elastic, then you should be very careful. Because if you push up the wage, then employment may fall a lot. So the Marshall's rules of derived demand gives us basically four conditions okay, to think whether this elastic labor demand is elastic or inelastic. Okay? This, is, this talks about Industry level elasticity of labor demand. One, labor demand is more elastic. First, the greater the elasticity of substitution. Why? Think of the what happens when the wage changes. Okay, behind there are two effects, right? The wage falls, the wage goes up. We learned two effects. One is substitution effect. The other one is scale effect. Those two have the same direction. So. Whichever effect is greater, it will make elastic labor demand greater. If the substitution effect is bigger, the elasticity of labor demand will be bigger. If scale effect is bigger, the elasticity of labor demand must be bigger. So whichever the so, so think of the conditions that makes either substitution effect greater or scale effect greater. One, if the elasticity of uh, substitution is greater, let's say, okay. Then, as I said, the substitution effect will be bigger. Okay? Think about it. Right? If the workers can be as easily replaced by machine, okay, what happens? When the wages go up, okay, then the, employee, the, the producers will replace, the substitute capital for labor. Because it's easy to do. Let's say they are easily substitutable. Elasticity of labor substitution is greater or easily substitutable. Basically, you know, that means the same thing. Okay. So let's like, for example, like if you Google really developed that, 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 let's say, truck that can go anywhere by itself. Okay. Then let's say some, then what you see now is the elasticity of substitution, right? Between this driverless truck and the driver gets greater. Okay? So let's say this for somehow for some reason this wage for drivers goes up a lot. Then some companies may think 
yeah, probably we should buy this Google thing, okay? Not the, you know, not the high, not buying this traditional truck and hiring people, it costs money. So let's just hire, let's just, you know, buy some this new truck and then, you know, we just get rid of some people. And if it's not possible, then obviously they cannot do it. Okay? Even if the wage goes up, they still have to hire people. Okay? So the greater the elastic substitution, the substitution effect is greater, so demand, the elasticity of labor demand must be greater. So you should be careful when you, so first thing you should look at is how easily the labor is substitutable. Okay. Second, the greater the elasticity of demand for the output, think about it. It affects what? It affects which effect? Scale effects or two effects? It should affect scale effect. Think of this is a, is a, is a labor demand in a particular industry. So we are thinking about monopoly situation. Okay. Wage goes up. Okay. Wage goes up, so they may try to, you know, cost is higher. So the company may try to, not the company, the whole industry now, they raise the price because the, the labor is, gets more expensive. What happens? Basically, what happens is that the demand for the output will drop because price is higher. By how much the demand drops will depend on elasticity demand, price elasticity, demand for the output. If it's very inelastic demand, it will not change much. Okay? So you can keep pretty much the same level of output. Okay? Or you can, yeah, or you don't have to adjust the output a lot. But if the elastic demand for the output is greater, then the, uh, the, the output, okay, when the wage goes up, the output will go down by greater extent. So scale effect gets bigger, so elastic labor demand gets bigger. Third, the greater labor share in total cost of production. So you hire, let's say, you know, you use capital and labor. So your total cost basically, you know, consists of two things, labor cost and capital cost. Think of a situation where that labor cost is very small. You don't actually need many people. You use mostly machines to produce things. Wage goes up, okay, this industry, but think of this industry. The, the marginal cost will go up, but not by much, because mostly capital cost, okay? But in the other way around, let's say the labor cost is the, is the most cost. Wage goes up, obviously. The, your marginal cost will go up by a lot. So then you have to produce a lot less. So scale effect gets bigger. So less is the labor demand will get bigger. Last one is the greater the supply elasticity of other factors of production. Okay. So in this case, This Google thing again, okay? The driver got more expensive. So now, what you think is, okay, we have to, we have to buy that, that new truck, driverless truck. But it depends on whether you can actually do it, will depend on how elastic the supply of that driverless truck, okay? So there will be more demand for the truck, but let's say it takes, you know, it takes a year to make, let's say, 10 trucks. Okay? Then obviously, even if you want to substitute, you cannot do it. But let's say they can now make, it, make this truck 100 trucks a day. It gets much more easier to find this substitute, right? So it depends how, not only how easily substitutable, but also how easily you can get that substitute. Okay? So these four things will determine the elasticity of uh, uh, labor demand, which these th four things, you know, you can think of, so let's say you are thinking of, let's say, some type of policy, and then you are concerned about elasticity of labor demand. What, what it tells us is that you have to look at these four things. How easily this labor is substitutable. 
what is the elastic demand for this alpha? Is it elastic demand or is it inelastic demand? Okay. And what's the share of labor in the total cost? Is it mostly, like, let's say, labor intensive industry or is it a capital intensive industry? <coughs> Last one is that how easily you can find that substitute. Okay. So, in some cases, and in other cases, for example, some industries, so for example, like a Elastic sub sub, so it's uh, mostly complements. Okay, capital and labor are complements, and then the demand for the output is very inelastic. Let's say, okay, and it's capital intensive. That means what? When the wage goes up, the labor demand in that industry will not change much. Okay, but if the other way around, then labor uh, labor demand will change. So, t for more detail, please read the textbook section three dash seven, and it, and. And this textbook section also has very interesting, very, very in insightful discussion about the union's behavior related with elasticity of labor demand. Okay? Uh, if I give you like a short introduction, from the union's point of view, what the union does is the union always tries to push up the wage. That's what unions do, right? The, that's the first thing that unions say, always. Raise the wage. Okay, when union tries to push up the wage, obviously there is a concern for employment. If they push up the wage too high, then they will probably lose employment. Okay. So what happens is that the union will think a lot about elasticity of labor demand. Okay. If it's inelastic industry, it's much easier to push up the wage. If it's very elastic industry, the labor demand is very elastic industry, the union actually cannot push up the wage too much. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's risky. Okay. So from that point of view, this uh, textbook talks about the, uh, the union behavior. Right? For example, page 110, union behavior to 111. So read about them. and. You, you can see some insights how the union uh, thinks. Okay, questions? You probably learned this, right, in, in the microeconomics, I think, class. Okay, some exercises. Let's do the exercise two, okay? Show that if the capital and labor are perfect complement, there is no substitution effect. How do you show? If it's perfect complement, the isoquant has what shape? L shape. Okay? Let's say it's a Q0. Let's say wage falls. Okay? If the wage falls, then what happens? What happens to the output? They will produce more or less. Okay? They're likely to produce more. Okay? So before, let's say, this was the ISO cost. Okay? Now in the new case, the ISO cost will be what? Flatter or steeper? Flatter, right? Because labor is cheaper. Okay. It's too far away. Cannot throw it much. I think of this one. Q1. Okay. <laughs> well, anyway, okay. Then, how do you show the scale effect? You draw a new hypothetical isocos line that is parallel to the old one, right? So it's gonna look like, and it touches what? You should touch. This right? Okay. Okay. So move on from here to here is what effect? Scale effect. Okay. 
then where is the substituent factor? It's nowhere, right? There is no substitution effect. Yeah, there is no substitution. No, obviously, if they are perfect complements, you cannot substitute one thing for another, one thing for the other, right? So that means there is no substitution. So logically, there should be no substitution effect. Okay. Try the textbook 3-1 example and 3-4. Okay, it has uh, some numbers, so you need to make your familiar with some uh, calculations. Now let's move on to the some topics. Okay, one is hiring quota, the minimum age adjustment costs. Okay, what is the hiring quota? AKA affirmative action. Okay, also known as affirmative. The hiring quota is is a, is a regulation from the government that tells the employers to hire a certain group of people at a you know for at least certain percentage. Okay. So it's usually like, uh, you know, let's say if there are groups of people who are considered to be discriminated against, okay, because of, let's say, race, black, or whatever, Hispanic in the U.S. case, or gender, female, because of age, let's say, elderly people, okay, or because of their physical condition, disabled people, okay. Then, let's say, normally, they are not hired much. Okay, so if you look at the percentage of these group of people, it's not that big. So, uh, one way of trying to correcting it is to impose a hiring quota. That means what they, they tell the companies to hire at least, let's say, 10% of your total workforce for, you know, out of this group, out of black, out of disabled. Okay. Actually, the Korean government actually do have hiring quota, for example, for the disabled. Okay, they have actually higher in quota. Okay, but it's obviously that it's not that well kept. Okay, and if do not meet the higher in quota, what happens? In Korea's case, they find the employer. Now you have to pay a fine. Okay. Yeah, but the news says that they uh, they rather pay pay fine than hiring disabled. But anyway, okay. So that's how it is designed. So it is actually used, okay? And it is often suggested if there is some problem in the labor market for the particular group, it is quite often it's suggested this you no know, hiring quota should be used. Okay, so let's make an example here. Let's say suppose that women are believed to be let's say discriminated against in the labor market. In Korea's case, for example, right? The labor force participation rate of women is quite low. So let's say let's, we think, OK, it's probably because of discrimination. Even though the, the women are very well qualified, the employer don't hire, employers don't hire women because they don't like women, let's say. OK? So let's say the, the government says, you cannot do that. OK, you have to hire, let's say, at least 30% of your workforce from female. Okay. That's the hiring quota. Let's assume that they strictly enforce it. Okay. If they don't enforce it, then we don't have to think about it. But let's say they strictly enforce that 30% quota. Okay. Now what happens? What is the uh, labor market impact? Okay. Good thing or bad thing? It depends. Okay, the safe answer is it depends. Okay. Yeah, but not always. Okay, think of this. Let's think of a company that uses uh, labor only. Okay, they can use men, they use men and women. They are not perfect complements, but not the perfect substitutes. So in general, they use both. Okay, so let's say. This is the 
Let's say Q star is their profit maximizing output level. Okay. So anyway, so they put Q star. Let's assume that this is the prescribed quota. In this case, it looks like 50-50. Let's say 50-50 is the quota. You have to beat 50-50. Okay. Then, then you look at a company that is not 50. Let's say they hire a lot more men than women. Let's say 80% men, 20% women. Okay. Are they maximizing the profit or not? We have 80% men, 20% women. From that, can you tell whether they are maximizing the profit or not maximizing the profit? Okay, first case, in this case, they are not maximizing the profit. Why? Let's assume this employer really don't like women. Okay? They have this prejudice against women. So they don't hire, they don't want to hire too much women. They hire just minimum level they can tolerate, let's say. So what happens here is that you have all these ways of using men and women combinations. Uh, then what this employer chooses is actually point P. Why does, why does he choose this? Because they can hire fewer women. What does it mean? Is the firm maximizing the profit? No, right? Why not? Because it's not minimizing the cost. Okay? So P is not obviously the efficient way of producing this, but still doing it because they don't want to hire too many women. Okay? It is possible. They can choose any point. Choose this. Now, because of the quota, they cannot have this P. Okay? It is against the law. Let's say if they break it, let's say the, this guy goes to jail. So let's say he hates, he hates going to jail more than hiring women. So he will start hiring women and will we'll keep the quota. And then it is possible that this firm actually have better profit with this quota. right? Because this quota forces this company to move to more efficient point from P to Q. Okay? So in this case, not only this policy corrects the discriminate, discriminatory practice in the labor market, but also makes it labor market more efficient, makes the, makes the economy more efficient. Okay? So one, that's one, po one possible thing, but that's not the only case, obviously. The other case is quite possible that the firm is actually maximizing the profit by hiring not many women, let's say, because of, let's say, technological reason, okay, that this company actually needs to hire more men than women, okay? For whatever reason, that is quite possible also. So the firm was at P. So this firm was actually maximizing the profit. But now, obviously, the government looks at it. The government is not interested in how much profit you make. The government is interested in whether you keep the quota or not. So P is not good. You go to jail. OK? So what happens? The firm now hire more women. So now it moves from P to Q, for example. Right? So what happens here? The profit will fall, right? So the economy gets less efficient. Okay? They're hiring too many women. Right? This firm is hiring too many women. Okay? So in this case, obviously, this quota makes economy more inefficient. Okay? So it depends on, it depending on what economy you live in, this policy may be a good thing, more maybe more uh, more making the, econ the making the economy more efficient or inefficient. Okay? So it depends on, for example, for example, basically if the economy is full of all these discriminatory practices, then it is good to have this higher in quota, right? Okay? Because it means that in many cases, a lot of companies are like this. 
because we, then making the quota makes actually things more improved. But if the discriminative practice is rare, let's say, relatively, okay, in that case, the high rate quota may be a bad idea. So the labor market impact of the higher quota depends on the extent of discrimination in the labor market. So you need to be very careful and you try to you know, impose this higher in quota. Okay, now what we are what you're thinking? Second topic, second application is the minimum wage. I just talked about minimum wage before. Then let's look at in more detail. First Let's look at our Korea's minimum wage. This is the, uh, the, the darker one is the nominal minimum wage, and the lighter one is the real minimum wage or at the constant price. So I just uh, use this, the, uh, the, the 2 on T10 price level. As you can see that it's increasing and increasing. Okay, it has been increased. And how much is it now? Do you know the number? Is it? 5,580? I was wondering, how come you know that number exactly? And I, I, I got the answer one another day. This Harry, <laughs> this girl, she was on TV or something. Is it? Does he? Does she show up TV and teaches you about minimum wage? <laughs> no, I, because I was talking to the freshman class, right? And this freshman class, I don't think they watch news much. And I asked about the minimum wage, and, and I was surprised that so many actually knew the exact number because I didn't know it. I was thinking, oh, it's around 5,000, 6,000. They, 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 quite a few of them had gave me the correct answer, 5,580. So <laughs> I was surprised. Okay, and then I was thinking, okay, I probably underestimated them. And I realized, and then one student told me that it's because of Harry. Okay, whatever, okay. So sometimes you, you she helps. I, I don't know. I rarely watch TV, so I didn't know it, it was shows up on TV. Is it on TV? Yeah. So what's the purpose of that, that, that advertisement? To teach you the minimum wage. And then what? Then ask you to report when you are underpaid. Is it? What does it? I, I, OK. <laughs> anyway, what happens here is the minimum wage now in Korea is 5,580. The minimum wage is, as the name tells us, it's a statutory wage level okay, that the workers can get at the minimum. Okay, so if you're working for or an employer, you should get at least 5,581 per hour in Korea in 2015. But there are exceptions, okay? There are a few exceptions, okay? So I'm not going to go into detail about the exceptions, but there are some exceptions, but most of the times you should get at least that amount. And what happens if the employer doesn't pay you that much? The employer can be fined or jailed, actually. I, but I don't think going to jail actually happens much. I, I know only one case, but... Uh, uh, but anyway, it's, it's a theoretically, it is actually, it's not theory, it's, it's, a, it's a by law, it's, it's, a, it's a punishable offense, okay? It's, it's a criminal offense. You will be charged in the court, but anyway. So the minimum wage has been in exist for a long, long time. In Korea's case, it started in 1988, so it has about 30 year history, okay? But actually, the, the up to 2000, Korea's minimum wage was very limited. It was enforced 
only to companies that hire a certain size of number of people on a certain industry. Okay? So it was very limited coverage rule. From 2000, however, they made it universal, meaning that any employee, even if you work for only one person, let's say you work in a, in a small convenience store, you are the only you are the only you are the only employee still you have to get paid at least this amount it's the law okay so from 2000 it became universal and then the rate actually got uh, risen faster and as you can see that this period was because the minimum wage was not keeping it, was, it increased only by around an inflation rate so in the real value, it didn't change much. Uh, if you look at the ratio of minimum wage to average wage in Korea, it's around 41%. It's around 40%. Okay? So compared to average worker in Korea, the minimum wage worker earns about 40%. Actually, it increased from like a 37%. Anyway, so every year, actually, Korea determines the minimum wage for the next year. So they will start the, the, uh, this discussing the minimum wage for the next year, 2016, and it's going to be very interesting this year. Okay. So, now, I think we should stop here, and then we will, uh, so next Monday, we will finish our discussion on minimum wage and uh, adjustment costs, and hopefully go on to the next topic.